It looks like the U.S. government will be back open for business tomorrow, at least for a couple of weeks. After a three-day stalemate, Senate Democrats and Republicans reached a deal today to pass a short-term budget that will keep the government up and running through February 8th. It also extends the Children's Health Insurance Program, or CHIP, for six years. And even before the documents were signed, Republicans and the White House were claiming victory. A statement here from the President of the United States. I am pleased that Democrats in Congress have come to their senses and are now willing to fund our great military, border patrol, first responders, and insurance for vulnerable children. All this time, the major sticking point for Democrats has been the DACA program, meant to keep people who were brought here illegally as young children from being deported, which both sides addressed today. The Republican majority now has 17 days to prevent the Dreamers from being deported. On February 8, 2018, it would be my intention to proceed to legislation that would address DACA, border security, and related issues. But if the last few days are any indication, a bipartisan agreement on immigration seems like a bit of a long shot. So did Democrats overplay their hand? And with the shutdown clock reset, what's the likelihood it's just going to happen again? Joining me are Boston College historian Heather Cox Richardson, Boston Globe Ideas editor Dante Ramos, and former state treasurer and Trump supporter Joe Malone. Thank you all for being here. Uh, I want to start, instead of sowing discord by seeking <laughs> consensus, can we agree on why this deal got done? Do you think, Joe, let me start with you. Why did this deal happen? Typically in, in the Washington world, someone's looking at polling and they're saying, this isn't good for us. And I think in this case, it was the Democrats, uh, where they came back to the table, pretty much uh, did what the Republicans were offering last Friday. So my sense is that while it started out looking good for the Democrats, the polling data was telling them, stop this, uh, this, this tactic, it's not working for you. Dante, does that sound right? Uh, I think it's partially right. Uh, I don't think anybody really comes away from this looking that great. Uh, you saw a lot of discontent uh, or di sort of disagreement even within the White House, where Trump last week seemed to be agreeing to something, and then John C Kelly called back and said that no, no, we're not going to, we're not interested in that. Uh, in the end, so I, I just, you know, I think that this is the kind of spectacle that. Um, you know, doesn't really breed a lot of trust in Washington, uh, and I don't think it really will lead to anybody looking all that great. Heather, uh, do you agree with Joe that the Democrats said this is going to hurt us ultimately if we keep on going, so we're going to reach a deal? Or Shutdowns always hurt people that are blamed for them. And I think what they're looking at in the long term, what Democrats are looking for, is that this is not, was not really a winning issue to shut down the government over DACA, which is 90 percent popular in America. Nine out of ten Americans actually want a deal for the Dreamers. And I think what they're hoping to do is look down to 2018 and say, if we can force the Senate, to, to, to take a bill that is a clean DACA bill, which is very, very popular, what they will do is they'll put Trump and Trump supporters in a vice of, you know, you want something that 90 percent of Americans don't want. How are you going to square that circle? And they're not going to be able to do it. They're going to hope it's on a national scale and people are going to be watching. So you're assuming that no DACA deal will get done in the next few weeks or in the next few oh, no. months? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. It, it may, in fact... It, it's going to be very interesting because, of course, what people are saying right now on the liberal Democratic side is that this is crazy to, tr to trust McConnell to bring this up because, of course, the 2013 bill, which passed the Senate, never got past Paul Ryan in the House. There's very little chance that this is ever going to go anywhere. Well, good luck with that if you've just promised that you're going to do it. And it's a popular bill. That's the kicker is that that's a popular idea. Do you two think a, a DACA bill might actually get done in the fairly near future, pre midterms? I didn't say it was going to get done. I said it was going to come up or, or Thank should you. come I up. Appreciate it. I, I think that uh, this is a, uh, a chess match here where uh, Trump uh, is going to say, I need the, uh, the, the chain immigration and I need the lottery to be done away with and I need the wall. And I think he's going to stand firm until he gets it. He wants to do the DACA deal, but he's not going to do it without getting something in return. Uh, I think it would be surprising if a clean DACA bill ended up getting done. I think it'll end up being pureed in with a bunch of other issues. Um, so I think that's it, a great metaphor, by the way. I like that. <laughs> well, I, I don't <laughs> no, know what to say. Happy. It's like a it's like a, a bunch of issues kind of put in together. And I think Mitch McConnell will be able to say, "Oh well, I brought it up, but um, yeah. you can't." That doesn't commit the House to doing anything on the issue. I want to go to a point that that you just brought up, Joe. You suggested that President Trump knows what he wants and is going to uh, stay firm and try to get it. You suggested that there may have been some inconstancy on the part of the president when it comes to what he was looking for. Um, let's take a listen to how Chuck Schumer recently described 
negotiating with Donald Trump uh, in this latest impasse. Let's take a, a look. Negotiating with this White House is like negotiating with Jell-O. It's next to impossible. President Trump's unwillingness to compromise caused the Trump shutdown and brought us to this moment. All right, so there's Chuck Schumer. Obviously, he's going to take hits at, at the president. But Mitch McConnell, the Senate Majority Leader, also voiced frustration at not being able to figure out what it was that the president wanted. I think we have a bite of him, too, and then we'll go to, uh, go to some questions. Let's see Mitch McConnell. I'm looking for something that President Trump supports, and he's not yet indicated <clears throat> what measure he's willing to sign. As soon as we figure out what he is for, then I would be convinced that we were not just spinning our wheels. So does the president actually know what he wants when it comes to issues like immigration, or does he just sort of go with whoever the last person in the room to talk with him was, whether it's Chuck Schumer or John Kelly or Stephen Miller? So what I saw of him, particularly on that first day that everybody called extraordinary, where he allowed the, uh, uh, the press in to cover that meeting that was a bipartisan meeting, he said he wanted it to be bicameral and bipartisan, so that there was a consensus among House, Senate, Republicans, and Democrats. And that's when Graham and Durver came in, and they had this other proposal, and he knocked it Graham down. Graham Durbin, yeah. Uh, uh, right. And, now, and, was that the same day that he said... I'm going to sign whatever they bring to me. It needs to be a bill of love, but I trust the people in this that was room. A, that, okay. was in the, that was in the okay, first Okay, so that changed but, a little bit. But the point is, think about him. He's, he's been heralded or he's heralded himself as this great uh, deal maker, negotiator. He leaves himself enough wiggle room, which the, Demo the, uh, the Democrats can criticize him for being not firm in what he, uh, he proposes and tries to follow through on. But from his position, he puts himself in an advantageous spot. Um, I think that he, that the president genuinely understands that it is a bad thing for the government to shut down, whether over uh, the DACA issue or something else. I think he's pulled in two directions. Uh, you know, obviously making a deal on this issue would have avoided a government shutdown. On the other hand, there is a pull, and you see it within, uh, you know, within uh, the discussions among the Republicans, even within the Trump White House, where um, people uh, representing the more nationalist side of the Trump presidency, and that would include Stephen Miller, the White House aide, who's been leading a lot of the policy on immigration, um, are not terribly interested in doing a deal on this issue. And I think that uh, Trump partly wants to make a deal, but partly is responding to that part of his base. Oh, come on. Let's look at the broad picture here. The only people who are firmly in Trump's camp right now are the white nationalists and the anti-immigration people. And I think at his heart, Trump knows that 90 percent of the American people want to do a DACA deal. So he's caught between these two extremes. What on earth is he going to do? Because he's a salesman. He wants to sell to both people. And he also is desperate to keep those anti-immigration people on his side. Why else would he have sent Pence over to talk to the military and use them as props? Why else would he have had the white House turning out that incredible uh, tape about if you call the White House blaming Democrats for everything that happened. Why else would there have been the re-election campaign's video saying that all Democrats were complicit in any murders that were taken that were committed by undocumented immigrants? Those are not DACA's. Those are criminal immigrants. I mean, the fact that he went so angrily for that base at this very moment says to me he knows he's caught between a rock and a hard place. He can't make a deal and he can't not make a deal. He's stuck. So That's the joke. To that. yeah, as someone who supports him, and I don't view myself as you characterize the typical Trump supporter by mind any you, means. Mind you, I, inf I didn't mean to uh, characterize you that way. I know plenty of Trump supporters who don't, who don't think that way either. But you have to look at the polls and say that he cannot make an immigration deal and so keep couple, that so support. So a couple points. Number one, among black males, he now has doubled his support, number one. Number two, in the congressional races, the generic ballot test, that lead that the Democrats have has been cut in half. Now, I think it's on both who, fronts who because it, uh, it was uh, CNN. On both fronts, it was a case, I believe, that the, uh, the tax uh, cut that they pushed through is now sh starting to show very positive signs. So the Democrats are left to go back to their identity politics where they have to say the Republicans are anti-immigrant, the Republicans are anti-black, the Republicans are anti-women. It didn't work in the presidential race, and I would argue they are going to be on thin ice if they think that's going to be their strategy for this midterm election. we got two minutes left. I want to shift gears for just a second. Mm -hmm. uh, you we're talking about people pushing Trump in a sort of a nationalist direction. The White House, you mentioned Stephen Miller. It may also be John Kelly, who grew up here in, in Brighton, who has reportedly pushed him to be more hardline on immigration. There's a report out today from Gabriel Sherman 
uh, at Vanity Fair, I hope I'm giving credit where it's due, uh, saying that John Kelly may be on the way out and that Ivanka Trump is already helping to look for replacements. I'm wondering if the three of you think, if John Kelly were to make an exit, would it make any difference when it comes to the way the president and the White House operate? Or would it be a, a non-issue? So I think it would be horrible if he leaves. Really? Why? Yeah, yeah. Because I think he has brought uh, stability. I mean, uh, some people would argue that is still uh, chaos there. I don't think that's the case. But compared to where it was with the, uh, the, the, the early days of this administration, it has moved uh, very much in the right direction. I think I'm one of those people who would argue that there's chaos <laughs> there. Um, I think Kelly has imposed a veneer of, of order upon it, but it's like any organization. The person at the top uh, sets the tone for the entire White House, and uh, the reason that the sense of disorder and chaos continues is because that exists within the president's mindset. So, Heather, what do, you th what do you think? Uh, I mean, apparently, I'm with you. I think we don't want to I, – I, I think that would be a, a, a real – that would that would really hurt the stability of the White House, such as it is. But I think that it's a very unstable White House, and it's getting worse by the day. And you cannot forget that a lot's going to drop this year. I know that's not a note of total agreement, but it's partial agreement, <laughs> which is kind of great. So Heather Cox, Richardson, Dante Ramos, Joe Malone, thank you both. Thank, thank, you. thank you all, rather, for thank being you. here.